Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's not two o'clock yet, so I'm just the warm-up act. Take your time, Bob. Um, one of the realities of the pipe organ and its audience is that we tend to be more like I am now. Although when I started being an organ aficionado, I was a youngster. So how many of you are 70 or above? Raise your hand. OK. You're, you're stalwarts. I salute you. And we're very happy that you are here. How many of you? How many of you are 30 or younger? Can we count them on my hand? <laughs> OK. This, this may become a problem in future years. As you can see, even with a lot of 70-year-olds, um, there are plenty of extra seats. How many of you, by curiosity, are for the first time in this miraculous space? OK. I came to Collegeville to take the job as music director at Minnesota Public Radio back in 1968. I drove out here in advance with a friend from school to check the place out to see whether I wanted them or whether they wanted me. I came before going to the radio station for my acceptance interview. I came into this church, which was somewhat mind-boggling. We had nice buildings out where I came from, but nothing at all like this. I had been studying at Oberlin on a concert hall instrument, which was very similar to the original instrument here. I had been working on a chorale by Cesar Franck that opens with some rambunctious gestures and then it rises in its thematic energy to a pinnacle and then there it, it just sort of peters off but there's a fermata over that empty space. At the concert hall at Oberlin, the sound dr dropped off after about a second and a half. Here, especially during the summer months, the sound lingers for six seconds. And suddenly I knew what that fermata was all about. And I figured if they accepted me as an employee, as it was the sixth full-time employee at what is now the monster public radio presence, Minnesota Public Radio and American Public Media, if they accepted me, I would probably be wise to come because if I could work out a deal with the then Abbey organist Gerard Farrell to come in here now and again, all would be well with the world. And that proved to be the case. I learned pretty much everything that I know about how to record pipe organs working with various musicians with this instrument. And it's really a delight to come back every time and be in this space, which even when the organ does not play, makes music of its own, especially on days like today when the sun is streaming through this fantastic stained glass window, coming down from the skylights above, illuminating the ambulatory areas as a lapsed Presbyterian, um, this, this, this is a truly inspired and inspiring ambiance. So we're getting close to 2 o'clock, and our other <coughs> presenters are here. So unless there is some real objection about starting a minute or two in advance, I think we'll get underway. Good afternoon. Uh, I am. I want to add. You have to turn it on. Have you turned it on? Yeah, yes. You did. Hello. 
Um, Are you understanding him with the mask? I think our mask should come off. Do I sound better this way? Yes. Yeah, I think we need to do that. Okay, now your microphone is live, too. Now my, no, yeah, I'm good. Okay. I, I just, that's all. I just wanted to interrupt so we don't miss what, what your... What we all need to do, probably, is speak clearly and succinctly and not too fast. Would that be useful? Okay. Someone asked, as I was wandering around, are you Michael Barone? Back in the days before the internet and pictures were not readily available, I would say, and I still do just because I'm that kind of guy, I'm one of them. I am not the Republican political pundit whose name is Michael Barone. Um, I've met the man. He seems very nice. I don't agree with much of his political agenda, but that's my problem, I suppose. And I used to also say, you don't look at all like I expected you to either. <laughs> and I was toying with whether I should trim my beard beforehand. I'm looking more like Father Christmas now. Um, but back in the day, this was all a very dark brown and even bushier than this. So I feel as though there's a certain bringing the circle full around. Joining me today are two distinguished gentlemen, Father Robert Coupon, who was just starting out early in his vocation here at the Abbey when I was starting mine down the road at Wimmer Hall. Uh, an exceptional pianist, improviser, and uh, these days, I would say the power behind why we are here Bob's persistence in realizing the excellence of the original Holt Camp design, but also its limitations, has been working for a good long time to accomplish what you will be enjoying today. And what has been accomplished is the work of the gentleman to my left. This is Martin Pozzi, organ builder par excellence. Bob and I were conversing years ago, and Bob had this idea that he wanted to expand the organ, and he asked me whether I thought Martin Pozzi would be an appropriate person. And I said, well, I really like what Martin does, but I don't know for sure that he would be willing to take on a project like this because he has not built organs with electric action before. Fortunately, I was wrong, and, and Martin, why don't we get into what was it that caused you to step outside your comfort zone? Well, my, my first connection to this place was Casey Marin, who I met for the first time at a convention of organ builders. And he was telling me a little bit about this, and I didn't really know exactly what he was talking about, but he was such a nice person that I just listened to him and, and, um, and then kind of got forgotten over the years. And then and one year, like four or so years ago, I was contacted by him again, and you know, because I think the monks, maybe um, Father Bob was, I think, asking him also for help. And so he asked me if I wanted to possibly be, you know, a part of this project and if I could maybe come and visit. It worked out that I was just in Michigan uh, finishing up an organ at that time and had to drive home a truck with the extra tools and materials that we had with us. And so I stopped by here, not really having any idea really what's, what's coming. Um, but here again, I think it was the building really that did me in, you know, I, once I walked in here, it's just the architecture, the feel of the building and the sound, and um, it just made me kind of very open-minded about doing something different, you know, it's just, and then of course also the people 
Father Bob, uh, Casey, and, and others who uh, welcomed me here as if as if I was their friend to begin with, you know. So it's um, so that's you know it's a very human side to this whole thing, to this business of organ building, you know, that uh, creeps in and makes these special projects somehow possible. It was interesting to see Casey last night in a monastic cloak. I'm just wondering, Casey, are you here today? Yes. Where, Stand up. Where are you? <laughs> Casey was, uh, I think, a trumpet major at St. John's, uh, got interested in organ building, worked with a fellow named Art Kurtzman, who was involved in the organ scene in the area. One thing led to another, and Casey opened his own shop, has built some phenomenal instruments in the region. If you ever get to the cathedral in St. Cloud, I think one of his most spectacular is there, and also a fine instrument in his parish church in Cold Spring, where he lives, which was an easy project because it was just a block or so away from his house. <laughs> Saved on hotel bills during installation. Thanks to the three of you, for causing this and for the many behind the scenes whose names likely are listed as donors in this booklet. If you have not picked it up, do so on the way out. And to the administration here at the university and the Abbey for being open-minded. Building new instruments is always kind of a mind bender for the people who count the money because it seems as though there is never quite enough to do what needs doing. And even if there is, the organist will think of ways to spend more. <laughs> <laughs> what you can see of this instrument is very little. On the sides, on either side, you see these gray painted large pipes. That's what would you say the percentage of the expense of this instrument is involved in those two 32-foot stops? Um, it would be about... We'll just give a dollar yeah. figure. Yeah, it would be like $100,000 you know, just for those Just for those pipes. two. Um, Bob, if you could pull this 32-foot, uh, not the Posan, the 32-foot open wood and start up at middle C on the pedal keyboard and come down. And now try the other 32 foot, which makes not the, the, the one over on the reed side, which makes a sound that one might think of as unholy. <laughs> It's been equated with the sound of helicopters. I think of, uh, there was a story on the radio on the way up of teaching cow, potty training cows to deal with the methane, <laughs> the methane gas. All right, we're, we're, we're getting ahead of our story in a way insofar as you're saying, what does 32 mean? Well, it, you can get sort of a sense because the largest pipe there is in fact 32 feet in speaking length from its mouth to its top. Pipes get higher in pitch as they get shorter. There are two basic families of pipes, one called the flues, which act like flutes. You blow wind through a windway and the column of air vibrates and produces the tone. Flues 
come in several families. We'll talk about those in a moment. Then there are reeds, which act much as a clarinet does. There's a mouthpiece. In the case of the organ, it's called the shallot. There is a reed, which is not made of reed, but is made of brass, a tongue which vibrates against that shallot. So two families. Within the families, there are a multiplicity of delights or evils, depending on your attitude. And Bob, if you could start with the 16 foot on the Grand Org, principal pipe, play low C. Grand, the bottom. Bottom keyboard. Okay, the lowest pitch he played was 16 feet. Now hold that note, take the 16 off and apply the eight. No, the principal. That's eight feet. Now put the four foot on. Two foot. As you can see, we make, we make ensembles of sound and increase the volume by drawing additional stops. The stops are the little controls to the left and right of the four manual keyboards. The four manual keyboards control various divisions of the organ. You cannot make an organ louder by blowing it louder. This is what happens. Actually, this is B3 on the eight foot stop. Nope, on the eight foot. And you tune, you tune a pipe by increasing or decreasing its length. So I can make this. There's, how many pipes are up there between the two organs? Um, 6,000, I think. 6,000. So when this organ goes out of tune, which is a rare occasion that everything needs to be tuned, but there's a lot of work up there, since someone has to sit down here poking a key, another one up there is going tap, tap, tap. Yep, not, not everybody's favorite job to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's show the differences in the principal stops on the Holtkamp organ and the new Posse edition. This is the eight-foot principal on the original Holtkamp. It's a really sweet, warm sound, rather demure. The purpose of the additions to this organ, to give it a little more body and oomph. Here is the same register. Now build the choruses up through the mixture. We'll talk about the mixtures originally, but just add the four foot and the two foot and the mixture on the Holt Camp and the same on. As you can see, the new material is robust and brave. Which is not to say that the whole camp is uh, timid. It's just, shall we say, demure. And it was planned that way. Since you notice the monk's stalls are immediately adjacent to where the organ is, and even at the beginning, there would always be someone who says, the organ is too loud. <laughs> I don't know what they're saying these days. 
Okay, the principles. There's also some principles. Okay, let's, let's, four keyboards, each containing pipes, each activating pipes of a specific area of the instrument. If you could see behind this screen, at the lower level, there is a swell division. Push some stops on the swell, just any number, and open and close the box. These are in a chamber, a wooden chamber, that has louvers on the front, like Venetian blinds, and they are controlled by a pedal in the center of the base of the organ, and with the organist's foot, he can open or close those, and that's why it's called a swell, because the sounds do indeed swell. Now, the sounds in the old Holtkamp swell are swell enough, but the sounds in the new Posse swell, which is at the second level and in the center behind this screen, So those are two keyboards and two divisions. The main division of any organ is called the great or the Hauptwerk. And we've heard the two choruses, and on this instrument they play from two different keyboards. It becomes a bit confusing for organists because in Eng England and America and Germany, generally the Hauptwerk is if there are three keyboards or four, it's the second from the bottom. In the French, however, they decide that they terrace things according to dynamics, and so the loudest is the one on the bottom. And here, the bottom keyboard is the new Posi division. The second keyboard is the original Hauptwerk on the Holtkamp. The new Posi swell is on the third keyboard, and the old Holtkamp swell is on the fourth upper keyboard. The third division in the original Holtkamp organ, which was not amplified or added to by Martin, he just built a two manual and pedal organ. The third division is called the positif. And Bob, if you would bring an ensemble sound both on the positif and the old uh, Holtkamp great, just 842. Very sweet and uh, a contrast in, in dynamics and texture, kind of like now between the new grade and the old grade. So uh, there are many steps in the ladder to heaven, as it were. Um, and then the pedals, which none of you can see, played by the feet, control a multiplicity of stops from both organs. The stops are laid out on this new expanded console in a way which allows the old organ to be played as it was in the beginning and remains and ever shall be, or can be blended with the new posi elements, or the posi elements can be played by themselves. Inside each set of stops, there are principles. Actually, next week's Pipe Dreams program will be called The Principles of the Thing. They are what you think of when you think of the organ pipe. Open metal cylinders of a certain dimension relative to the ratio of diameter and length. There are other pipes that are also metal and open at the top, which are strings. They are of a much thinner scale, right? 
how, what, what happens when you shrink the scale of an organ pipe? To, 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 accom to accomplish this um, stringy sound, um, it's built narrower, and then at that point you need to trick the pipe into doing the proper speech to the attack, the first, and then the sound comes on, and it just, uh, we call it stringier, but what it really means is you hear more of the overtones, the harmonics. Now, the string on the Holtkamp organ is a gamba. What is the shape of that pipe? The gamba, I think that's a tapered. Uh, yeah. So as it gets to the top, it becomes thinner. It becomes thinner, yeah. And the gamba on the Holtkamp swell sounds like... Open the box. And is there a principle there also? On the swell, no. uh, play play the the eight foot octave down, or the, the four foot octave on the swell down an octave. Yeah. And play the eight foot principle on the grate on the hold camp. Okay, you can see the difference. The, the strings are keener. But even keener is the string in the new posi swell. Compare that with the Spitzgamba on the Holtkamp. So it's not just volume, it's quality of tone. Color, yeah. Color. Strings usually have very close friends. Martin, can you describe what makes a Celeste celestial? Yeah, typically, so this, there's a second row of pipes that will play with the viola, and that one is either scaled a little narrower or the same, uh, but it is tuned a little bit shorter, so it's you know untuned, so to speak, from its original pitch, and there it undulates and makes this heavenly sort of sound. Bob, can you flip the toggles of this, hold, hold a chord on the viola, and then flip it off and turn the celeste on so we can hear. Okay, take the viola off and go back and forth between just one or the other. Okay. Now, I don't know whether we, whether we dare talk about this in church because uh, when they are both together, it's, it's uh, you know, kind of like teenagers in the back of a car. <laughs> they, they get very familiar and create something beyond the two of them. What we haven't talked about are the flutes, which also are flues insofar as they work. This one happens to be made of wood. What's the, what's, what wood pipes do we have there in the hold camp? The hold camp has the copal, I think, copula. The copula. There are metal flutes also, the, the roar flute on the positive. <laughs> D 
This pipe has a stopper in its top. The roar flute made of wood or the, of metal also has a stopper, but there is a chimney that comes out. Martin, talk about what happens when that, when yeah. you, both when you stop a pipe and then when you put a chimney on it also. Yeah, when you stop a pipe, we just, uh, on a metal pipe, we would just um, solder on uh, a lid um, and then tune on the ears. But what happens is the, the wave cannot, you know, be extended up where it wants to be for that pitch, but it has to come down back to the mouth and therefore we are going to miss the first overtone of the pipe. And that fact changes the character of the sound. And, and when it's partly open like a chimney flute, then there are other things like that, similar things going on, but you know, it, it strengthens a different kind of overtone just to make a different sound. The Gedeck eight foot on your new grate, is that metal? Yes. Okay, let's hear the Gedeck and compare it with the copula. In the smell, huh? in the uh, see, I think. Uh, There's no stop foot on that. Oh, excuse me, we're talking about the stop, yes. In, in, um, I'm, yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking at the hold camp thing. There, what am I looking at? Well, there's this, okay, we've got a 16-foot Borden on the new Ray C, yes? And an 8-foot also, without the 16. Oh, and a Borden, I'm sorry. Yes, that's... There are two flutes that sing falsetto. They are called harmonic flutes, flute harmonique. Martin, explain also what's going on and where does the harmonic elements come in? Yeah, so these flutes are made almost like a principle, um, and then, but they are made double length of what they really speak on. And, and then they get voiced, so they will overblow. Um, just like when you blow into a recorder hard enough, it will go blow into an octave above. Sort of like that, yeah. And um, <coughs> more, more musical, I think, <laughs> as we'll hear. Well, the, the point of overblowing is, is kind of maybe just um, the craft or the art, whatever of voicing, you know, to get that just into the right place. A lot like a voice, you know, you want everything inside your throat just to be in the right place to get the, the, the smoothest or the, the most musical sound. Um, but anyway, these harmonic flutes, they don't really like to do that consistently unless there is a little hole just in the, about in the center of the pipe where the bass pitch would want to sound. So where in the keyboard do the harmonic pipes begin? So on an eight foot, it's sort of in the middle octave. Further up a little bit. Yeah. And you can sort of tell that it sounds like it's gone falsetto. And the big one on the on the ground org. Four foot also. And the the French composers in the nineteenth century uh, were particularly fascinated by this sound and wrote some gorgeous solos. Um, Let's stick with the hold camp positive for just a moment and hold your low C and go eight foot, four foot, print, uh, four foot flute, two foot, 
Nazard. And TRS. Let's again hold hold the bottom note and add those in in sequence. Eight, four, two and two thirds, two terrets. So there are five pitches sounding down there. A little chord with unison octave, octave quint, super octave, terrets. So. C, C, G, C, E. With that registration, go up the keyboard. As you can see, when it gets higher, it becomes more knit together. You don't hear the individual pitches. This is called a jeu de tiers, or the, the game <laughs> with the tiers, uh, or, or the cornet. Um, there's one pretty feisty new cornet on the new grate. Cornet five on the Grand Org. Middle C. Middle C. Cornet, cornet five on the Grand the Org. Middle C starts. Now, it sounds very reedy, but it's really made up of five flu pipes. Yeah, five, five flues. It's really just the natural progression of the, the first tiers. five over first four overtones. And uh, there are some instruments that have no reed pipes, which we're going to get to next, but have a reedy character because of these cornets and uh, adding a bit of spice. Now let's get to reeds. Remember, it works like a clarinet mouthpiece with this vibrating brass tongue. Let's do the trumpet on the Holtkamp Hauptwerk compared with the trumpet on the new Grand Org of Pazzi. Pet eight, yeah. Which is kind of a bassoon on the Holtkamp swell. It's kind of a quasi trumpet. So the three of those go up the keyboards from posi trumpet to Holtkamp trumpet to Holtkamp fagots. We should not forget in the new swell of Martin Pazzi, there is also a trompet. Other reeds in this instrument include the hautbois and in the new Pazzi. There is a full-length bassoon in the Pazzi swell and a half-length bassoon, oh, quarter-length in, 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 in the, in, in the Holtkamp. Oh, Holtkamp, um, 
Yeah, that's a fractional length. Fractional. Uh, so the 16 foot reads in the two swells, Bob. Again, it's quite clear that the new material is, uh, shall we, it's been working out. As with the principles, you build ensembles of reeds. Let's hear the full Holtkamp swell reed chorus, the 16, 8, and 4. Now closing the box, and then 16, 8, no, 16, 8, no, 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 no closing the box on the posse and the 1684 on the posse and compare that with the whole camp with the box open. Okay, the, the, the open Holt camp swell and the closed posse swell are close, but now open the posse swell. And it almost sounds as though the whole camp swell is closed. Um, we heard the most disturbing sound in the new pedal division but there is a chorus of reeds down there, and if you would bring on the 32, eight, yep, 32, 16, eight. You meant it to be that way, did you not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's important for these stops to, to be able to come through the full organ, or some of them anyway, to play melodies in the French music especially. So uh, Olivier Latry told me once, because I was worried that it get too large, he said it could never be too large, it doesn't exist, uh, an eight-foot trumpet in the pedal being too loud, so he encouraged me to go further with it. I think you did. <laughs> there are two stops called Crumhorn or Crumhorn or Krumhorn. One is very Germanic, originally on the Holtkamp Positive. It is like a little Renaissance reed pipe. And German organs tend to have chromorns that sound sort of like that. But the French uh, put more wine in their sauce, I think. There is repertoire that calls for all of this, some of which you may hear today, other of which you might have to come back to fully savor. This is one of the delights of instruments of any size. They will show themselves off in different degrees depending on who plays them and what repertoire is chosen. The bigger the organ, the more option for variety. We've covered, I think, pretty much, well, actually, I'm going to first ask, does anyone have a question at this point? Shout it out slowly and distinctly. I was going to get to that. You have to save something for last. 
Does anyone have a different question? <laughs> None. Okay. Powder? Pardon? I still can't hear you. How long did it take? How long did it take to build? It took about two years with our crew of four or five people. <clears throat> Plus, we spent you know a number of months here on site, getting everything in the right place. So How many pipes in the new instrument? About three thousand, close to three thousand. Okay. You have to remember that you cannot go to IKEA <laughs> and buy these things, nor can they be mass produced. These pipes start out as a pot of molten metal, which is then laid out in a sheet, which is flat. You have to cut those sheets into the appropriate sizes. Well, why don't you tell a little bit? Yeah. <clears throat> Pipes, yes, the casting, we cast the metal, which is um, tin and lead alloy, with various percentages, uh, on a granite table. And that granite, I just saw some correspondence from many years ago, and I didn't know, did, had no clue about this place here. And um, that first correspondence was with uh, Cold Spring Granite Company. And they then referred me to somebody else because of the nature of the, the tool that I needed, something very large and specific. But anyway, uh, the, the, the metal gets poured at about 650 degrees onto this table, and then we, you know, it, it cools down, and then we end up with a sheet about 14 feet long and two, two and a half feet wide and various thicknesses. And then the, 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 the metal gets cut out to appropriate size, the, to the scale of the pipe. That's the circumference of the pipe and the length, plus the foot, which is the tapered part. And from there on, you know, the, you know we always work on a whole set, you know, not just one pipe at a time. Even though the whole set, there's, each pipe is, has a different measurement. I mean, in this organ of 6,000 pipes, there might be just a very few that might be, by coincidence, more or less, to be actually the same size. But the rest is all different sizes. So we um, first sort of compose those sizes, you know, according to what I think would be right for this room or, or, or necessary. Is there a, a cookbook, as it were, with recipes so that you know, oh, you come in here and you uh, absorb the acoustic of the space and then you go back and flip through pages and said, the scaling of this rank of pipes needs to be this way or do you... Uh, yeah, that's, um, there are some cookbooks out there, but um, you know, that's not how we typically work because you know, how many rooms like this exist, you know, really. It's, um, so we have to, I think, use knowledge or like experience and intuition, mostly for me anyway, um, to know what to, what to do about this measuring business of pipes. Um, so I, I just, um, you know, absorb the room first when I arrive the first time to, to, to listen to the room and see it. And, and then have a fee go home with a feeling, basically, you know, and, um, and then compose, basically, the sizes of the pipes. How long would it take you to make a pipe of this size? If I just made one pipe like this, um, you know, just to show somebody, um, probably about 20, 30 minutes. You know. But when you get to the bigger ones... Oh, well, yeah, this... So a bigger, the double size is not just double the amount of time, but exponentially more plus, and then it goes, you know, on from there and there it goes. An eight foot pipe would take me more than a day you know, to make from scratch. I look at this wooden pipe and I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pieces, each of which need to mate up with their friends. Um, 
That's why I say to people when they ask me how many parts really are in an organ, I usually say, and we did count kind of, you know, um, hundreds of thousands of parts actually in an organ like this. Because that pipe, you know, like you just counted, had already almost 10 parts that needed to be first made and then assembled. So it's, um, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a fun profession, obviously. How did, how did you get to be an <laughs> organ builder? Is this something that you were pestering your parents about as a youngster? About organ building? Yeah. Yeah, I did, yeah, and they didn't. <laughs> But they, they didn't have a, a friendly ear towards that, so at first uh, tried to discourage me because they thought, well, all the, orga all the churches they knew that existed already had organs, you know, so they couldn't think of that being a good business to get into the profession. But, you know, I, it, um, once I was able to make up my own mind, I, I did. And that was at what age? That was at 21. And to become an organ builder, it takes more than deciding to yourself that I will be an organ builder, yes? Yes, yeah. You have to find a person that takes you on as an apprentice uh, to learn that. There is a system like that, you know, in, in, in Europe, uh, with schools and, and a shop and with a master to... to, to um, to learn the profession. It takes, for organ building, it takes four years. And then uh, you can call yourself a journeyman of organ building. And then you have to, in Europe, if you want to have a shop of your own, you have to become a master. Uh, that's almost all more like administration and business uh, schooling. Uh, but you have to be a master in order to train apprentices. In Europe. So it's, it's, it's very different here in the United States. I could decide to be an organ builder, print up a little business card that so. says Michael Barone, voice and voicer, mm -hmm. if you wish, and that's all it would take. <laughs> all I would need was uh, the hubris. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, but you know, that's why we have this idea here about um, with the wood shop to expand the wood shop and turn that also into an organ building shop that will um, have the opportunity to train apprentices and, or to, to welcome pre apprentices, young people or any age really, um, to learn the profession you know, in, a, in a sort of traditional way. And, and I think um, this idea is going somewhere and I'm really happy about that because I would be coming back here to live here, actually. Can I just add that, um, first of all, I've been to Martin's shop, and I, I watched him make a pipe. Uh, and it's an amazing process, and he's a true artist. So you go to a different um, shop, a different organ builder, and they might, uh, it might sound very different. These are it's truly heavenly what, what Martin can do. And we, I want to make sure that we can pass that on because there's always going to be churches and theaters and, that want uh, organs. And so we're, we're, I'm very excited that we hopefully can do that here. Uh, he's the master. He really is. I always see that organs are not going to go away as long as, as people want to hear them. And, um, and hearing these compositions that we're going to hear this afternoon and also last night. Um, it's just a necessity. I think I'm very I'm optimistic about, about the whole scene. There might be waves going up and down, but um, it's going to survive. But we also have to do something for it. You know. Um, a little difficult question, but I, I, you know, we, we tend to make wooden pipes, uh, I mean the large pipes out of wood, and low frequencies are not very fussy about that sort of thing, uh, as long as it's strong and solid enough 
to withstand the, you know, those waves going on inside that, that, that column. Uh, but we use um, yellow tulip tree, you know, poplar, but also cherry, walnut, you know, for smaller pipes, we would use more like a hardwood. Uh, but it's not like a violin or a guitar where the sound board actually is extremely important for that, for the sound, you know, for the sound uh, development. There's somebody here. Any others? Yep. Um, the size of this instrument, total number of ranks is what, 113? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, in, in close. It's not the largest in the state. I believe there, for instance, is a larger organ at a Baptist church in Eden Prairie, the Wooddale Church, which has, uh, I think, 118 or 120. Um, the organ at Northrop Auditorium, for instance, and the one at Central Lutheran Church are 108 ranks. Also, uh, St. Andrew's in Matamidi is 108 ranks. Those are three very different sounding instruments, despite the fact that they're all, quote, the same size, unquote. Um, size does not necessarily make or break the instrument. There is much that you can do with a big organ, but large organs sometimes uh, do not have the refinement that something small uh, and the challenge for any organist is to find the beauty in whatever it is they are playing upon and to extract that beauty and apply it to music that works and not try to play music that doesn't. So the size is not necessarily equivalent with quality. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, that's a separate, because I think you mentioned that. Right. I mean, there's a certain amount of bragging rights to say my Tribute. organ's bigger than yours, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that sometimes only proves that you have more money, but not, you know, more money does not necessarily make you a smarter person. Um, any last question? Yeah, and then we'll get to... Okay. Yep. Every pipe of the 6,000 that are up there, every pipe works like this one. There's wind. The, the keyboard is pressed down. It activates a valve beneath a pipe which is standing on a chest with compressed air. When that valve opens, you get sound. And depending on how many stops you have, depends on how many sets of pipes you are putting into play. The more stops down, the more sets of pipes are sounding, and the more air is going through more of these and making more noise and uh, getting you all excited. Yep, just like a flute. Think of a flute or a clarinet. The sound comes out of the sound comes out of the instrument, as it were, and in this case, the instrument is <laughs> multiplied by dozens and dozens. What makes the in, the pipe organ unusual is that it is a huge wind instrument, which is provided wind from a blower, and if Bob pushes a stop or all the stops and holds a key down, the organ will play. Stravinsky complained that the organ has no humanity, you know, it just sounds forever. It never takes a breath. The challenge of the organist is through the manipulation of the keys, space between the notes or lack of space, to give the organ breath. This is the most complicated of musical instruments that it's possible to maneuver the multiple keyboards and pedal boards, think which stops you want to use to create what effect, do it 
in this case, at a distance between where the actual sound comes from behind that red screen and set it alive in this room in a way that will not only impress you with its colors, its dynamic range, its power, but also with the expressivity of the music that is being shared. It would seem impossible, and we take organists far too for granted, and I think what you will experience this afternoon is the art of four remarkable young people who have tamed the beast and let it perform what they want to express with the music that they have chosen to play. And all right, the gentleman over there wanted to hear the trumpets. There is one set of really bold trumpet stops, and they are mounted above the swell division of the old Holt Camp organ, and they are facing forward just to make sure that every ounce of energy gets to your ear. Um, bef uh, I know those seats are hard, so if, feel free to stand up. Uh, when you come to church, you, you have to stand up, and then you sit down, and then you stand up. It makes it a little easier. So before the, it'll be just a few minutes, and we'll start the program, but do feel free to stand up. Thank you, Michael Barone. Thank you, Martin Pazzi.
advance warning, you are going to hear four exceptional young artists who are products of the Organ Studies program here at St. John's and St. Ben's. It's always interesting to have multiple players on a single instrument because each comes to the organ with their own ideas as to how organs ought to sound. And as a result, you will probably hear aspects of this organ revealed that might not have been the case had only a single player played. A few words of additional warning. Organists like organs come in all sizes and shapes. And although the organ console does not change to adapt to each organist, the bench, its height, and its position relative to the keyboards can be altered. And so there will probably be some moments of fiddling between individual performers as they adapt and adjust so that they can play at their very best for all of us. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here who have opted to come into this miraculous space rather than wandering around on this beautiful campus on such a beautiful day. Note that there will be a reception out under the bell banner afterwards, I believe out there, somewhere outside, where you can feel free to mingle and refresh yourselves amidst the glories of nature. But for now, the glories of art and the pipe organ, our first performer, Anne Phillips, would you welcome her?
There are many who should be applauded. Hold on, you four, just a moment. Kim Kasling, are you here? Would you please come up here? This is the man who taught these four. You cannot imagine the patience and diligence of this man to be able to take these four pieces of raw wood <laughs> and turn them into the artists you have enjoyed today. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, players. Memories you have all generated today. Refreshments are over in the ambulatory in the vicinity of the front of the Great Hall, the former Abbey Church. We hope to see you there.